That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Eternal Daughter, the sixth film directed by Joanna Hogg, her third to be produced by Martin Scorsese, uh, which premiered in competition at the 2022 Venice Film Festival and is being released courtesy of A24 on December 2nd, 2022. Do I know Joanna's other films? No, probably not. But uh, she's her international breakthrough were The Souvenir Part 1 and Part 2, uh, which, interestingly enough, starred Honor Swinton Byrne, the daughter of Tilda, with, and those films were semi-autobiographical about Joanna Hogg's own life as a filmmaker, and Tilda Swinton played her mother. So we're getting into meta, 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 with Tilda returning, playing another facsimile of Joan, and as Rosalind, the mother of Joanna. Anyway, there's, there's a lot going on, and apparently Joanna Hogg is reliving her memories through uh, Tilda Swinton as an avatar. You really liked this movie. I did, but I can understand. It, it's a very slight film, and it will defy your expectations, both, I think, as being an A24 film uh, and uh, the look and feel of it. I did not care for it as much as you did. You've seen it twice now. Yes. The basic story is very basic. So it's set in modern day in Wales. Yes. A mother and daughter, both played by Tilda Swinton, are traveling to this like fancy hotel bed and breakfast type place to celebrate the mom's birthday and also sort of a retreat for the daughter to write like a screenplay. And we find out that that like mansion was the home of the mother when she was younger during like 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 she was holed up there during world war ii it was her, her aunt her aunt aunt joss mm -hmm. yeah so there's some history there and her daughter oh the, the mother only ever spoke kindly about her experience there but throughout the film we hear more and realize that it wasn't all great living there so <sighs> Just to spoil it, because there is a gag, we get to the end, which is the mother's birthday, and they're having dinner together. It's important to know that there is no one else in this hotel. It felt like The Shining, kind of. Yes. <laughs> There's no one in the hotel. The Shining is a reference point, I think. Yeah. Except the front desk person, who's also like the main server in the restaurant, and then we see like a groundskeeper. A night porter, yeah. So there are only like four people in the movie. Who's much, much like Scatman Crothers mm -hmm. in The Shining, yeah. So the server brings the table like a birthday cake and then the daughter gets all upset like, no, you're not supposed to like reveal there's a cake, give it to me. So she runs and grabs the cake and brings it over. And we see the server looking at her like, this bitch is crazy. And then we pan over to the table and realize there's no one at that table with her. This entire movie, the daughter's been talking to herself. Ros the Rosalind was never there. The end. Um, okay. I feel like I've seen a number of films that feel like psychodrama <clears throat> where it's like it's alluding to something creepy and the way it's shot and the score and the lighting. We think that there might be something going on. And this film does that too. And then when we first meet the mom and daughter, the fact that they're both played by the same actor is a clue that something's not quite right. Then this big hotel and the... I don't understand why the front desk agent tells her, oh, you're, the room you want is not available. There's someone booked in it, but then there's no one in the hotel. So within the first 10 minutes, I knew that something wasn't right. And I asked you like, oh, is one of them dead? But then like nothing happens, like nothing, it doesn't amount to anything. So really the feeling I got about this movie and the title I think is very appropriate. Yeah. Is that this daughter... During the final scene, she explains to her mother, because the mother's being a little persnickety about dinner, that all I've ever wanted is for you to be happy and you never seem happy. Their relationship is very polite and mannered throughout the film and also I get the sense throughout their life together, lives together. And then the daughter says, like, I spent so much time worrying about you, I didn't worry about myself. I don't have children, my marriage is messed up because of you. So I feel like at that moment, I think I should have felt more like emotional, but instead I was a little frustrated because I spent the 90 minutes, or however long it is, thinking that there's something more that's going on. Sure, but it, it really is just about an exercise in a daughter 
acting out her guilt and remorse and regret yes. as concerns her mother, who even in death is haunting her to a degree where she thinks it's, she explains it as she feels like she's trespassing and even thinking she has the right to make a movie about her. And yeah. an- another meta thing is it's about this screenwriter, a la Joanna Hogg, suffering writer's block in the, in the exercise of this kind of expiation. So it's like addressing the writer's block even allowed her to move beyond. But there's a whole lot of other... Uh, interesting elements that are very subtly laid about, like as in the reading material um, that she, that focuses on this Rudyard Kipling story she's reading, uh, they in 1904, which is all about uh, supernatural exercise and Kipling dealing with his own dead daughter, or uh, she's reading uh, a book about I forget the title of it about do not painting houses, but that's about kind of uh, writer's block and uh, arrested creative development. And the name of this hotel is, I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, the Welsh pronunciation is Moel Famen, uh, which is named after a mountain peak, but also means bald mothers. Uh, what you said makes sense, and I think it's executed well in the film. It just isn't because everything's so, like, they're so polite to one another. Like, nothing's happening. The only time anything gets kind of elevated is the dog, because they brought their dog to this hotel. Louis. He goes missing for a second. But then even that I didn't like, because the dog goes missing, and then she's chasing it outside with the groundskeeper, and then all of a sudden the dog's back in the room, like, cuddled up with the mother. Who was not there in the first place. Uh, I didn't care for that. I also didn't care for the fact that the way I didn't like the way the film was shot, which is funny because I think it's speaking to a lot of Giallo films like Mario Bava, shot by Ed Rutherford, who previously lensed Archipelago for uh, Joanna Hogg. I, I kind of like that that menace, but again, yes, if you're expecting, because at first you're like, what are they vampires? And it does have that Daughters of Darkness vibe, where these assumedly mother and daughter show up at this hotel uh, and seemingly are maybe death incarnate. But I wish that. What could have been better for me is the same thing, except that the mother, like the one who's dead and in the other's mind, did most of the talking. So that, because the other thing is too, movies like this where there's like a gag or someone's dead, then what's the fun part about it is to rewatch it and try to get clues. Sure. And I feel like with this film, it's not there because she's interacting with her mother so vigorously. And obviously, there's even a point, like, the mother's carrying around a bag, like a plastic bag and her purse, and the server slash front desk agent comments on the bag. So that means that the daughter has been carrying around her own purse, her own books, plus the mother's bag and books. But also, metaphorically, this baggage. Yes, but it's very, like, thinking about it and thinking about how, because the front desk agent is very, like, Rude. Rude. But rude, not not like, um, uh, like, t- she's not being mean. She's just, like, annoyed by this customer. And upon a rewatch, you would think, oh, because this lady's crazy. She walked in pushing, like, a thing. But, but, but the problem is, again, oftentimes with these movies, when you look back, the person's body language and everything matches. Sure, and how it's shot. Like, they're not sharing the same frame. So so then it's like, okay, if her mother's just in her imagination, does that mean she walked into the hotel hunched over pushing an imaginary wheelchair? Well, and also Bill, the night porter, has a scene where he's speaking with the mother, but... He, I don't like... Like, yeah. Well, and it's misleading, but he also... It, it's about... I wrote down... There's that moment in the Amityville Horror where James Brolin castigates Margot Kidder... And he says, houses don't have memories, but it turns out they do. They do contain memories for you if you are in it, if you had those memories existing there. And so it's like Bill, the night porter, is able to kind of tap into that because he hasn't retired because his own wife, who worked with him for 30 years, died there. So he stays working to stay tethered to her memory. Uh, so it, really, it's a memory poem, but in a tradition that's not unlike Edgar Allan Poe, Robert Graves, very turn-of-the-century uh very dry ghost stories. I don't dislike the story. I just think that, I think the perfect word is misleading. I, I almost wish the mother never would have left the hotel room so that it wouldn't feel so crazy because I was what I didn't finish is that the rude front desk agent looking or thinking about it after watching it 
is probably being that way because she's seeing this lady act crazy. Well, like every night at dinner, she's talking to herself and ordering two plates of food. And and that person played by Carly Sophia Davies, who's making her debut. But there is kind of a poignant moment when Tilda's, uh, when Julie Hart is checking out. It's after that birthday scene. And she says to her, I just want you to know, I hope you're okay. Because the birthday scene is a little traumatic. This is where we see her really get bent out of shape. It's all traumatic. If I was the only, if I was the only employee in this hotel with my only guest who's talking to herself the entire trip, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is that that craziness, like once you realize that that lady is by herself in this hotel, it takes away from the emotion for me a little bit. Sure. Like, like sure. because that final dinner scene, I did feel like I should have felt a little bit more than I did, but I was so distracted by the fact that like, wait, wait, wait. So she's been carrying around these bags and she's been pretending, she's been ordering two plates all this time. And it, and then again, with the dog and with the groundskeeper acknowledging the mother, which I'm assuming he did because we, I think one of the better scenes is the groundskeeper, after the dog goes missing and is found, the daughter goes and thanks him for his assistance. And he says, well, come have a drink with me. Let's celebrate. And then he tells her, you know, my wife, I met my wife working this hotel like 30 years ago and she died, but I still work here because it reminds me of her. And I like to play the piano because she didn't flute or the flute because he learned it after she passed and he wanted, he's playing it for her. Like, look what I learned. So I, so I thought that scene was effective in explaining why maybe he went along with the daughter pretending her mother was there. Cause he also has those feelings. I, I, I just don't think it's refined enough. Sure. Which coming from me is some bullshit, but you know, I even for me, not the most refined person, it felt a little clunky. It, it well, it feels like a very personal and deliberate film, uh, which I'm fine with. I am a fan of Joanne Hogg even before the Souvenir films, which you know I think Souvenir Part Two is, you know, so far uh, my favorite of hers. But uh, th there are a lot of it, I don't know. Double dose of Tilda is hard to well. Out. Tilda as the mother. A I couple, love her as a the mother. A couple of times she made me giggle. Like it, she I just guess. looks ridiculous. Well, that hair. Did you not like her hair? I thought she kind of looks fantastic. No, her wig that. looks. It's very well installed. I'm just saying that I think. And it's the same wig she's wearing in the souvenir films, but. I, uh, like again, it, the the same actor playing two different roles, and then the way it's shot is very obviously like they're like you know they're not even trying to do split screen. Right. It was kind of distracting because it's like th this clearly is not mother daughter. I think, yes, and it's all about mirroring, though, too, and I think that really sure. feeds into uh, deeper meta-analysis, albeit, again, it's a very dry, personal ghost story, uh, so I can understand kind of a, a, you know... I think this would have looked better as a book, or I could see this being a play. Sure. But, what would you give it? I gave it, out of the Venice Film Festival, three and a half. I still maintain that. It's clear that Hogg has an affinity for Tilda. Tilda starred in her very first short back in 1986 called Caprice. Uh, it's, I, I don't know. It, it, it has a, a very easygoing, freewheeling uh, tone to it, but that I, I do agree also could potentially be a little bit dull. But if you read if you read those old Edgar Allan Poe stories, those old Robert Graves stories, they, they do have a... Ambrose Bierce, they do have a very dry element to them, a matter of factness. And I, I, if you, you are into that, I think this is a nice wavelength. I think if you go into it knowing it's not a horror film, it's, uh, it's very quiet and subtle, then I think you would enjoy it. I was very in the middle about it, so I'm going to say it's okay. Two and a half out of five. Okay. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.